Stand, if you would, and turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. It was nice to uh, be together last week to celebrate uh, our 75th anniversary as a church and God's faithfulness to us through uh, all the years. And uh, we're going to get back now to our study of the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to pick up in verse 13 of chapter 2. Jesus went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. Remember, he is at the moment in Galilee, um, and he has uh, uh, spent some time in Capernaum and then said, I need to go around the whole region preaching. And so Mark is reminding us that that's what he's doing. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners." Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Again, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed. And so are the skins, but new wine is for fresh wineskins. You can be seated. As we continue in our study of Mark's gospel, I want to begin today by saying a few words about how Mark has structured the first few chapters of the gospel. As I've noted several times already as we've been working our way through chapter 1, Mark wastes no time in getting to the point of why he has written his gospel, and he tells us what that is in the very first verse, where he makes the claim that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that his coming is a gospel, good news, that changes everything. And chapter 1, as we have seen, relates several accounts that support that claim. We heard the voice of God himself from heaven saying of Jesus, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's quite an endorsement from God himself. Jesus healed people and he cast out demons and he demonstrated that he had authority both in the natural world as well as in the physical as in the spiritual world. And he taught the scriptures with an authority that the people that heard him had never witnessed before. He even claimed to have the authority to forgive people's sins. And that led a lot of people to begin asking. Could this, in fact, be the Messiah? You can imagine the conversations that must have taken place around the dinner tables all over Capernaum and Galilee. 
People asking those questions and talking about it. Did you hear what Jesus did? Have you ever heard anyone like him before? What do you think? Could it be that the Messiah has come? Could it be? But there were other things that Jesus said and did that didn't seem very Messiah-like. And they didn't fit with the popular expectations of what people thought a good Messiah should say and do. Most people, of course, thought that, especially the religious folks, thought that the Messiah should look like them, right? And Jesus didn't look like them. And so that caused a lot of people, especially among Israel's religious leadership, to have grave doubts about him. So in chapters 2 and 3, Mark goes on then to share several accounts that describe the growing conflict between Jesus and the religious authorities. And if you'll, if, if you'll notice in Mark's, uh, in that section, there are five different accounts that he gives. Uh, And the first one has to do with his identity. He claims the power to forgive sins, and they rightly observe only God can do that. Is he claiming to be God? And if he is, that's a problem for them. And you'll also note, um, as if, if you look at those different accounts, as we read a couple of them this morning, that the people that are being um, identified are the scribes and the Pharisees. And the scribes and the Pharisees were very focused on the law of Moses and keeping the law of Moses. The scribes were experts in the law, and they spent a lot of time talking about the, all the minute details of what it takes to follow the law and be faithful to the law and what people should do to make sure that they're in compliance with the law. And so Mark is describing that growing conflict between Jesus and that particular group. There were other groups that were against him as well, and as we get further into Mark's gospel, we'll find that uh, the, 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 um, the Sadducees, which were another group that were kind of focused in Jerusalem, also turned against him and had great problems with him. But Mark is telling us here in chapter 2 and 3 that the rift between Jesus and the Pharisees became so great that by the time we get to chapter 3 and verse 22, they had already decided that Jesus must be from Satan and not from God and that the power he had came from Satan. And in chapter 3 and verse 6, we learn that they had already begun to plot how they were going to destroy him, how they were going to get rid of him. And Jesus himself put his finger on the nature of the conflict in the two short parables that he gives in chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, which were at the end of the text that we read this morning. He said, No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. The problem with using new cloth to patch an old garment is that new cloth hasn't shrunk yet. So if you sew it to material that's already shrunk, as soon as you wash it, the new cloth will shrink and the old cloth won't, and you'll have a worse problem than you had to begin with. That's just the basic point. Old wineskins pose the same problem in the opposite direction. If you've ever popped the cork of a champagne bottle and seen it fly across the room, you know that the fermentation process produces gas, which causes the pressure inside the bottle to increase. In the ancient world, wine was fermented in leather pouches called wineskins. 
but new wine had to be stored in new wineskins, which could stretch as the pressure inside them increased. But if you put new wine in old skins that had already been stretched out, the rising pressure had nowhere to go, and the wineskins could burst, ruining both the wine and the wineskin. So those are the two stories and kind of the, the, what lies behind them. But the point that Jesus was making with these two parables was that the religion being promoted and taught by the Jewish religious leaders and the gospel that Jesus embodied and that he was proclaiming were fundamentally at odds with each other. They were as incompatible as a new patch on an old garment and new wine in old wineskins. It's important to understand why they were incompatible. It wasn't because Jesus was proclaiming something different from what the Old Testament had said. Jesus himself made it clear in Matthew 5 and verse 17 that he had not come to replace the Old Testament, but to fulfill it. He said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So the problem was not that Jesus wanted to do away with all the history of Israel and all the history of Judaism in Israel and the law of Moses and the teachings of the Old Testament. He wasn't throwing out their Bible and saying, let me give you something new. Rather, the problem was that the Judaism of the first century had dramatically departed from what the law of Moses and the rest of the Old Testament actually teaches. And as we'll see from the accounts in this section, the religion of the scribes and the Pharisees had misrepresented the true intent of the Old Testament. And they had misrepresented it in two important ways. First, law had eclipsed love. Law had eclipsed love. Secondly, ritual had eclipsed relationship. Ritual had eclipsed relationship. The Old Testament law of Moses had always been about loving God and loving your neighbor. If you go all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, where uh, we first hear the Shema, which in fact Jewish men were supposed to say every day when they woke up. It was supposed to be the first words out of their mouths. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. In Matthew 22, when Jesus was asked which was the greatest commandment, Jesus repeated those words from the Shema, and he said, this is the first and the greatest commandment. The law is about loving God. And then he went on to say, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, and this is important, on these two commands depend all the law and the prophets. In other words, you can know the law inside and out. You can be familiar with the prophets and everything that they said. But if you do not love God and you do not love your neighbor, you have missed the entire point of the Old Testament. And the rituals that the law prescribed, rituals like fasting and the observance of the Sabbath, 
were intended to facilitate relationship with God. It was through the observance of the rituals that people were to be drawn up in their thinking, in their minds, in their awareness, to to be thinking about and engaging in relationship with God. But instead, the Pharisees had turned the rituals into religious prescriptions. And those prescriptions had no more to do uh, with loving God than anything else. In fact, they had more to do with displaying their spiritual superiority. And they had added then all kinds of new rituals with all kinds of regulations about things like the proper way to wash, to make sure that you stay pure, as though washing your body can in any way affect the state of your soul. And instead of obedience to the, law of, to the law of Moses as an expression of loving God and loving one's neighbor, they had turned the law of Moses into a list of regulations to follow with legalistic precision. And they had added hundreds of additional laws that they then spelled out in minute detail so that everyone knew what was and wasn't acceptable. All of that led Jesus to issue a scathing indictment of them in Matthew 23, verses 4 through 7. He says, The scribes and the Pharisees tie up heavy burdens that are hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders, but do nothing to help people carry them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, and they make their phylacteries broad. Those were the boxes that contained the scriptures that were supposed that, that they tied to their foreheads. Imagine walking around in Kroger with a box on your head. And they make their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogue and being noticed in the marketplace. And being called rabbi. Such was the state of Judaism in Jesus' day. A far cry from loving God and loving one's neighbor. A far cry from knowing God and pursuing a relationship with him. It's no wonder that Jesus was to them like new wine in old wineskins. They expected a Messiah who would join their club. Instead, what they got in Jesus was someone who at every turn challenged their assumptions about what it means to be godly. So let's look briefly at these two accounts that we read today, and then we'll look at two more next week. So if I do okay, you'll come back. If I mess it up, then it might be empty next week. The first account is in verses 13 through 17 and is connected with Jesus' decision to call Levi, who we also know as Matthew, who was this tax collector, to be one of his disciples. And that that account, I think, speaks to the tension that I mentioned between law and love. Tax collectors were the most despised and reviled group of people in Israel. They were a greedy and unscrupulous lot. There is no denying it. They used the protection of the Roman government to steal the hard-earned money of the common people. And they were able to do that because tax collectors in the, in the Roman world were actually tax contractors. So they would agree with the Roman government that they would raise a certain amount of revenue, and they would go out and they would raise that money. But anything beyond what they agreed to give to the Romans that they could get, that was money for them, and they could pocket it. And so they routinely inflated the charges in order to line their own pockets. 
and they sought to get rich mostly off the backs of the poor and the working class. Even more reprehensible to most Jews was the fact that tax collectors worked for the Romans. So they were seen by their fellow Jews as traitors who had betrayed their own people in order to consort with the enemy and to assist Rome in their exploitation and repression of the Jewish people. So if Jesus was out to make a good impression on the religious establishment, enlisting a tax collector into his inner circle was not the way to go about it. But Matthew's willingness to leave his lucrative occupation behind in order to follow Jesus tells us that he must have heard Jesus preach and been profoundly impacted by it. We can imagine that as Jesus preached, he heard something much different from the message of condemnation that came from the Pharisees. And no doubt, he began to believe that God actually loved him in spite of what he had done with his life. And he came to believe that this man, Jesus, could show him the way to be free from his burden of guilt and regret. So we can understand why he would want to share the hope that he had discovered with his friends. And so he invited a whole bunch of folks just like him to his home for a meal with Jesus. And many of them had no doubt heard Jesus before. And they too, like Matthew, had responded with a sense of hope. They had resigned themselves to the idea that they had been excluded by God from God's love, but now there was an opportunity. This was a different message. They were hearing something new. As you can imagine, that Jesus would even associate with such people, let alone go to a tax collector's house and share a meal with them, would not have sat well with the Pharisees. Just walking into a tax collector's house would make a person ritually unclean in their minds. And to share a meal with them was a sign of affection and acceptance. Which, by the way, is exactly what Jesus wanted to communicate. But that kind of behavior was in the minds of the Pharisees a clear indicator of Jesus' lack of spiritual character. How could a man of God who presumed to be a teacher even think to do such a thing? And so we can picture them asking his disciples with an air of pious disdain, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? More of an accusation than a question. Jesus' answer in verse 17 is both an explanation of why he associated with deplorables like that, and it's also an indictment of his accusers. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came to call the righteous. I came to call not the righteous, but sinners. In their zeal for law-keeping, they had no room for a God who actually loves sinners and is willing to go wherever they are, not to condone their sin. Jesus never condoned sin but to make known to them the good news that God has provided a way for us to be forgiven and to leave our life of sin behind and to be made whole. And what the Pharisees couldn't see 
was that they needed the healing that Jesus came to offer just as much as the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the sinners that they despised. But thinking themselves righteous, they remained in their sin while the people they condemned were finding forgiveness and healing. So in Matthew 21 and verse 31, Jesus says, The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you, Pharisees, religious people. The second point of conflict had to do with the practice of fasting, and it speaks to the tension between ritual and relationship. In verse 18, Mark says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to Jesus, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? The practice of fasting is a good example of how the Pharisees had added all kinds of regulations to the original law of Moses. The law required that people fast once a year in preparation for the Day of Atonement. And from that, people fasted for various reasons at at other times, but the law only prescribed one time of fasting each year. But in Jesus' day, it was the practice of the Pharisees to fast two times every week. So when they observed that Jesus' disciples didn't fast, they made another accusation against him, veiled in a question. John's disciples fast, and we and our disciples fast, so why don't your disciples fast? What kind of teachers, teacher are you if your disciples don't even fast? And yet you travel around the countryside claiming to have been sent by God. The thing is, fasting is supposed to be an expression of lament, especially over sin, which is surely the spirit in which John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, were were fasting. And God had commanded an annual fast in preparation for the Day of Atonement because the Day of Atonement was about cleansing the people from their sin. So it was appropriate that they should spend time examining themselves and coming to terms with their sin in preparation for that day. Kind of like we do during Lent in preparation for Easter. Lent is a season of self-examination to be aware of our mortality and our sinfulness as we anticipate the celebration of Easter and the grace of forgiveness that we have in Christ. So that the grace of forgiveness is made that much more meaningful. And the joy of being cleansed from sin is that much greater. And so that their relationship with God and our relationship with God can be strengthened by the gratitude that we have for the forgiveness that we have so freely received. Psalm 32 talks about that. It begins with the words, Blessed, happy, is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, whose sin is atoned for. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. And when we come to that place and we realize that we're sinners and we are reminded and lament it, and then experience and are refreshed in the the awareness and knowledge of the forgiveness that we have received, then that brings us closer to the Lord. And so the psalmist says, You are my hiding place. You, God, are my place of refuge. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. The Pharisees had taken the ritual, which was intended to help us see our need for forgiveness, 
and they had turned it on its head, instead making it a measure of their piety and an occasion for spiritual pride. And instead of observing the ritual as a means to a deeper relationship with God, it had become for them a replacement for a relationship with God. We can see that in the parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 18 about the tax collector and the Pharisee. And Luke tells us that Jesus told the parable to those who trusted in themselves and treated others with contempt because they were righteous and the others were not. So Jesus says, the Pharisee prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. Why? What is my claim to righteousness? I fast twice a week, and I give a tithe from all I get. Can you see the sad irony in that? Jesus' reply is again a subtle indictment of the Pharisees. He knew that in their zeal for law without love and ritual without relationship, they would ultimately turn on him and reject him. In John chapter 8 and verse 19, Jesus tells them that the reason that they rejected him, that they did not recognize him, was because they did not know the Father. They were too busy with ritual for relationship. They were too busy with law for love. They were very religious, but they had lost sight of the very heart of of their religion, which was to know God and to love him. And Jesus knew that because they did not know God, they would reject him also and ultimately have him put to death. And so he says in verse 19, wedding guests don't fast while the bridegroom is with them. A wedding is a time for feasting, not fasting. And Jesus' presence in the world was like a bridegroom's presence at a wedding feast. It was an occasion for joy. It wasn't time for his disciples to fast. But he went on to say, anticipating the day that Israel's religious leaders would hand him over to be crucified. He said, the day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. couple points of application. First, I think it's important for us to not just read this passage and say, oh, those nasty Pharisees. We are all inclined to replace love for God with law and relationship with God for ritual. And we do that, I think, because ultimately it's easier to keep laws than it is to engage in a relationship with God. And it's an easier barometer for us. But Scripture reminds us that God isn't interested. Psalm 51 verse 7 says, God isn't interested in the blood of bulls and goats. The sacrifices that he desires are a contrite heart and a broken spirit. In Isaiah 58, we don't have time to to read the whole thing. I wish we did. Um, But um, go home and read Isaiah 58, because the the whole chapter is about fasting. And Israel is complaining. We do all this fasting and all these other rituals, and it doesn't seem to do any good. And God says, of course it doesn't, because your heart isn't in it. Is not this the kind of fast I desire? To loose the bonds of wickedness and to undo the straps of the yoke? To share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless into your home? 
Jesus repeated that same idea in the Sermon on the Mount. He, he said, don't do your acts of piety in public so that they can be seen and they just build you up. It's about you and God. It's about your relationship with him. And I would suggest that none of us are ever beyond the temptation of turning relationship into ritual and love into law. Secondly, it's essential that we learn from Jesus how law and love are complementary rather than mutually exclusive. Jesus wasn't abandoning the law for the sake of loving people. There are two sides, two, two sides of the road and two ditches that we can fall into. On the one side, we fall into the ditch of legalism, which is the struggle that the Pharisees had. On the other side, we fall into the ditch of license, which is condoning sin in the name of love. But Jesus never sugarcoats or condones sin. He loves us enough not to tell us that we are well, when in fact, our sin is killing us. Let me say that again. Jesus loves us enough not to tell us that we are well, when in fact, our sin is killing us. But his message is, is that God loves us in spite of our sin and has provided a way for us to be forgiven and restored. And he, and if we will only turn to him in repentance and faith, we will be healed. Finally, our response to the godless says a lot about the state of our own relationship with God. Just like the Pharisees' response to the tax collectors and sinners said a lot about them. If we are quick to despise and condemn those that we consider to be sinners, it's evident that we do not yet have the heart of God toward the lost. And it likely reveals that we have not yet come to terms with our own sin. There's a great scene in the movie Jesus Revolution, which a lot of people have been talking about, and Sharon and I uh, were able to see it a couple of weeks ago. Um, Chuck Smith, who, who uh, um, uh, kind of is one of the main characters and was instrumental in the beginnings of the Calvary Chapel movement that continues today, was having a discussion with some of the elders of his church as these hippies started coming, and there are more and more every week. And, and the elders are really upset about it, a couple of them anyways. And one of the arguments is, look, we just bought new carpet, and these people with dirty bare feet are tracking all over it. I love the scene where the next week, They arrive at church, and there's a line of hippies, and Chuck Smith is on his knees washing their feet. I came to seek and to save that which is lost. Aren't you glad that he came looking for you? And when he found you in the squalor of your sin... I don't care if he found you in an office. I don't care if he found you in a brothel. I don't care if he found you in a gay nightclub. I don't care if he found you in a pew. You were in the squalor of sin. And when he found you, he did not turn away from you, but he came toward you and he lifted all of us out of the pit and set our feet on solid ground. Not the solid ground of our righteousness, but the solid ground of his righteousness. So let us go and do likewise. Let us go into the world, not as self-righteous guardians of the law, bent on condemning the law nor spreading the toxic lie that everybody's just okay, but proclaiming the hope of the gospel, 
that in Christ there is forgiveness and life. Amen. Let's pray as the worship team comes for our closing song. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that in the ways that you need to speak to us today, that we will allow your word to penetrate all the defenses, all the self-righteous edifices that we tend to build up in our hearts and minds. That you will renew our desire to love you with our whole heart and mind and strength and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And Father, that you will, by your spirit, enable us to keep our focus on you and to pursue relationship with you that we might indeed know you and be like you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace to you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Go in the freedom and redemption that you have experienced and be an ambassador of that freedom and redemption that Christ might be glorified. Amen. God bless you as you go.